This is the Master Brewers Podcast, brought to you by the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, a volunteer organization dedicated to continually improving the products and processes of our membership since 1887. Let's go! 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 Master Brewers brings you interviews with the industry's best and brightest in brewing science, technology, and operations. This Master Brewers podcast is proudly sponsored by Hopsteiner, a global leader in the hop industry focused on quality, sustainability, and innovation in new hop varieties and hop products. Contact our brewery sales team to provide you with the hop-related tools you need to craft your next great beer. For more information, visit hopsteiner.com. Additional support provided by... Get to know Proximity Malt. We malt superior, European-style, low-protein varieties grown close to home in Delaware and Colorado. Domestically grown, precisely malted to style. With our team of seasoned experts and two brand-new malt houses, try what's really new in malt. Check us out at www.proximitymalt.com. Additional support provided by... The secret to quality fermentation is White Labs. Core strains are made weekly and most can ship out the next day. Order through the White Labs app or yeastman.com. Visit whitelabs.com backslash whitelabs for a new customer special offer. That's whitelabs.com backslash why whitelabs. We just finished up with Blushing Monk, and that was actually a Belgian uh, ale yeast strain that, that could outcompete our house yeast. This particular strain um, that we brought in did grow on a selective auger for wild yeast, so we were able to uh, see it when it was supposed to be there. And then also we checked uh, fermentations that were very close to um, those tanks to screen for any sort of cross-contamination. This week on the show... We talk yeast with Founders Brewing Company's microbiologist, Wade Bigro. Uh Wade, what kind of QA do you recommend running on yeast that brewers purchase from a third-party lab? Sure, John. Well, I think, um, you know, at the very least, the best QA you can do is um, look at the, the C of A, you know, the health check that's coming with the yeast um, from, the, from the yeast supplier, right? So they're going to uh, be doing a lot of the microbiological tests, a lot of the um, the health checks uh, there. So at the very, very least, you know, you can take a good look at the paperwork that comes with the yeast. You want to make sure that it's the right species. You want to make sure that you got lager yeast if you ordered lager yeast. Um, also take a look at the uh, the types of microbiological checks that they did. Um, if anything seems out of the ordinary, they shouldn't ship it to you. But uh, it's also good, um, you know, as, as the end user of this yeast to take a good look and study that C of A and, and learn a little bit more about the tests that they're doing. Um, and, and furthermore, I think if they're, if they're not doing certain checks that you'd like, uh, you can push back on your yeast supplier and, and have them do that. But uh, I always tell people, you know, if you're just purchasing yeast and you don't have any laboratory uh, support, uh, you really have to lean on them as a third-party supplier um, for, for your beer. So uh, it's best to just take a really good look at the C of A. Um, but, you know, if, you, if there are uh, a little bit, uh, if you do have laboratory uh, space, um, you could do some plating. But even if you don't have that, you can do a quick sensory check, you know, pop open the jug of yeast. Does it smell OK? Uh, does it look good? Um, just general sens- sensory. It's OK to taste the yeast, um, you know, check the pH if you can. Um, but just some very basic things uh, that you can do that can really help you avoid trouble if you have a bad batch of yeast that comes through. So let's break that down into like stuff that pretty much a, a brewery of any size could do versus stuff that maybe you're going to do at Founders that's, um, you know, not everybody's going to have the equipment for. So, I mean, as a as a real tiny, you know, even brew pub or whatever, you're, you're certainly still going to be able to do a lot of the things you said, including do a cell count and see if it's actually the re- the same concentration as what they what they what they're telling you it is, right? Right. A cell count to double check is is outstanding. Um, that's a, that's always a great practice to do. Um, and then I always uh, tell um, brewers that are really small just take good notes. You know, check the fermentation performance against uh, you know the last time you ordered that particular yeast, or as you reuse generations, um, take a good look at the um, the timing. 
you know, it, it doesn't hurt to uh, take a gravity check every day or maybe two times a day and uh, generate a nice fermentation curve. And um, you can use that to compare against prior fermentations. Uh, if, if you do have a curve that looks out of the ordinary, that may be a sign that uh, your yeast was not uh, top notch, but uh, with the microscope, you can do a lot of stuff. So you could do viability checks. Um, you can also make sure that only yeast are present. You may see some protein and that sort of thing from uh, the the process of growing the yeast, but you shouldn't see any bacteria. Uh, the only live cells that should be in there uh, should be brewing yeast, and they should be healthy and and budding as well. It's also a good way to audit your own process too, because you know if you're getting consistent results and you're getting the same counts that they are, then you know you've got a, your process is working, right? Sure thing. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, there's a whole lot that you can do with just a simple cell count. Um, and if you do have trouble with that, there, uh, there are great, uh, you know, tools online for you to use to help you uh, do that and, and take care of the math. Okay. So how about some stuff that a, a larger brewery might, might be doing? Like, do, do you guys, are you guys running PCR on, on new yeast that might come in from a third party? Yeah, you know, we've, we're fortunate where um, we have cryogenic storage here at Founders, so we really don't have to purchase from a third party anymore. But um, whenever I grow up uh, yeast from our, our cryogenic storage, um, we're doing a thorough check. We're doing everything from um, typical plating for um, wild yeast aerobic bacteria, anaerobic bacteria. Um, we're also occasionally doing a petite mutant test that can look for any sort of mutation. Um, and I also use PCR to uh, make sure that the species is correct. So um, at Founders, we're fortunate that we only have one main ale strain and one lager strain, but it's really important that um, when the yeast department orders a new culture that I provide them with the right species um, and a, a pure culture too. So. Um, if you don't have PCR to check for the, the species of the yeast, um, WLN auger is really good at sort of, um, you know, telling you if you have ale yeast or lager yeast based on the, uh, the morphology of the colonies and uh, the color. Um, but it's important to, you know, do that from the get go when you get a new culture in to make sure that you know what that species looks like, what that particular strain looks like on WLN auger. Okay, how about, how about evaluating yeast post-harvest um, rather than incoming yeast from a third-party lab? Uh, what do you guys do at Founders, and what makes the most sense for the smallest of breweries? Sure. So, um, once again, you know, we're really fortunate here at Founders where a lot of our uh, yeast is, is right from the propagator, um, but we do occasionally harvest, and, and that does happen um, oftentimes with our, our lager strains. Um, we do a, a, a cell count, um, cell density. We look at the health as well. And then also, whenever we harvest, um, we submit uh, samples to the lab, and it really goes through our full um, uh, quality checks. But um, if, if you're not able to do that, it it's always a good idea to look at it with the microscope. Um, you know, you can see, uh, you know, yeast that are, are dying, that are in poor health. Um, a pH will also sort of show you if you have a bunch of yeast dying, the pH will kind of will go up um, with cell death there. And then also it's, it's always a good idea to do a little sensory check, you know, smell it. Does it smell like your normal yeast? Are you getting um, some phenolic off flavors? Um, that sort of thing could key you in uh, to any problems. And then also um, with the microscope, it's great to uh, take a look for any bacteria that you may have picked up um, in the harvesting process. So uh, I think harvesting and reusing yeast uh, is a great, great thing. But if you have something that can outcompete um, your house yeast, you can biomagnify it uh, with every generation of, of harvest there. So um, it's, it's a beautiful thing to be in full control of that, but also uh, you need to really uh, be careful with your process and make sure that you're doing it properly. Talk about that petite mutant test a little bit more. Is that something that's practical for a small brewery? Um, you know, it's, it can be practical. It's one thing that we really look at um, when we wake uh, cells up from cryogenic storage. Uh, but I suppose if, if you do harvest um, yeast over and over again, it, it wouldn't be a bad thing to do. Um, the technique is, is fairly simple. It uses um, just a general uh, Petri dish that you grow up healthy colonies. Um, the, the one drawback from this is that it takes about five days to, to generate a plate with colonies. but um, once you have that, you're, you're really shooting for a plate with individual colonies that you can see. So um, use your microscope to look at cell density and then plate. And I usually shoot for um, at least 100 cells on a standard Petri dish or colony. Um, 
and they can be they can go up to 500 or so. But then once you have those healthy colonies, um, you can um, use a color indicator called TTC, and you mix that in with auger, and you make an auger overlay. And um, any normal uh, healthy yeast are, are going to quick uh, change to a, a red color. This just takes a couple hours. Um, but if you do do have a T mutant test, they won't uh, change. They'll just stay kind of that white tan color on the auger. And then you can count, um, similar to a, a cell count, how many petite mutants you have in the whole population there. So it's something we do uh, check from time to time. Um, we also like to utilize a third-party yeast bank um, that uh, with our particular banking package once a year, I'll collect uh, samples of our house ale and lager yeast from uh, just the process, from a propagator, from a fermentation tank, and send that off to uh, the yeast bank. And they um, compare uh, the, the DNA um, and look at that and compare it to our cryogenically stored stock culture. And they can tell us if we're seeing any uh, drift there. So um, that's, that's a bit of a sort of a, a high-end thing, but a lot of um, companies that do bank yeast as a third party, they will offer that um, once a year or something like that. But um, if you don't have that, that opportunity, you can certainly do a petite mutant test too. You've talked about becoming familiar with sweet spots during the lifespan of a given yeast culture. What exactly do you mean by that? So, you know, um, I think that purchasing yeast, uh, it's a nice way to get a new culture in-house, but you may not see uh, peak fermentation performance with that first usage, right? So you need to uh, make sure that the yeast are, are healthy. They may have been a little stressed um, during shipping. Um, you may not have a really healthy pitch going in, although it looks healthy on the microscope, but they will adapt uh, and get and get used to your wort. So uh, some people talk about sort of a sweet spot, maybe generation three or four. Um, but generally, I've heard that sometimes the first time that you use a new uh, cell line for fermentation, uh, the first time won't perform quite as well. But um, that's where it's important to uh, track your fermentation, generate those fer fermentation curves every generation. And that way, um, you can look for any sort of problems. Um, furthermore, that sweet spot, if you see it at a particular generation over and over again, it can help you prepare and order more yeast if you need to or set up a propagation uh, because you know that it, it will eventually slow down. Uh, so that, that's a great way to just uh, get used to the scheduling and sort of the pulse of your brewery by finding that sweet spot. What are the sweet spots for some of the strains you use at Founders? So we do see, um, you know, a little bit of a downtick in fermentation for uh, sometimes the first generation. But uh, just as I said, we're really fortunate with a really great propagation system where a lot of uh, the yeast will come right out of the propagator fresh. So uh, the lettering or the tracking of generations, as um, most people think about with harvesting, doesn't really apply because they're coming right out of the propagator. But um, we certainly do see... Uh, you know, strains that we do harvest um, wear out after 10 uses or so. How do, you, how do you go about that when you're working with a culture that you're not already familiar with? Well, uh, that's a great question. So we just finished up with Blushing Monk, and that was actually a Belgian uh, ale yeast strain that, that could outcompete our house yeast. So we were really worried about that um, as, as a whole production team here at Founders. But um, you know, fortunately, we, we took extra steps to um, take a good look at uh, the fermentations, become, uh, have a good idea of how, how they perform versus our house ale yeast. Uh, and fortunately, this particular strain um, that we brought in did grow on a selective auger for wild yeast. So we were able to uh, see it when it was supposed to be there. And then also we checked uh, fermentations that were very close to um, those tanks to screen for any sort of cross-contamination there. But it did take us a little bit of time to get used to um, how that performed differently. And it was a bit of a risk because it could outcompete our house ale yeast. So in theory, if we did have a little bit of contamination there and continue to propagate our house ale yeast, um, it would eventually magnify that, that uh, different Belgian strain uh, and show some, some problems later down the line. But uh, I think it's a, a great opportunity for me to just say um, how proud I am of the yeast uh, team here at Founders and the seller team. They do an outstanding job with cleaning and sanitation to manage uh, 
uh, those kind of oddball yeast strains that we occasionally use. How about some tips for harvesting practices? Sure. So, you know, harvesting, again, it's a beautiful thing. You can um, have control of, of your yeast. You can um, save a lot of money and time by, by having it in-house. Um, you know, treat it as um, something that really requires aseptic technique. I mean, more, more than ever, because um, you're harvesting these cells that you need um, to uh, continue making beer and, and brewing. And if you are um, compromising that by not using aseptic technique, you're going to run into problems later on. So um, I always suggest, um, you know, I, I know it can sometimes be hard, but plan weeks in advance. Uh, put some brews down on the schedule that you know that you're going to uh, brew with. They're going to be yeast sources. And then um, that's going to take a little bit of pressure off you um, if, do, if something does go wrong with harvesting. But um, you know, it's always great to have a good um, sanitary brink or um, keg, something like that, uh, to store it in. And then um, it always helps to do some of the microbiological and sensory checks um, after harvesting there. Could you talk about any tips that you might have for easy ways to use data to sort of get in front of problems? Yeah, so... Fermentation curves are, are going to be your friend here. I know they can be tedious to um, do and, you know, build a chart and do it time and again, especially if you're really used to a particular strain. Um, but I suggest um, looking at fermentation curves by the hour if possible and have a, a, a nice graph there. If you do compare uh, fermentation curves with with prior ones, and you see sort of a change in terminal gravity or a change in uh, sort of the, that first drop uh, during fermentation. That's where it can key you in on having some problems. So, um, you know, one thing that a brewery may see is uh, the final gravity of their beers decreases; it gets smaller um, after harvesting subsequent times. So um, that could key you in on. Yeah, I don't think the yeast are are getting more. Uh, or they're not getting stronger or healthier or better at that. There may be something that you're biomagnifying through harvesting. Um, so that may key you in on, eh, maybe I have another strain that I use in-house that um, is actually sort of working its way into um, this particular culture. You may also have a microbiological contamination with something like diastaticus or Brettanomyces, which can cause super attenuation there. So, um, it's always good to have a good fermentation curve and become comfortable with your final gravity. Um, you could also be keyed in with something like this if you um, see sort of a spike in, in BDK or um, something like that where you normally don't see it. So that that's certainly something to look at. Um, you may also run into, you know, your final gravity or terminal gravity increases um, as you increase in generation time. And that I always suggest um, to take a look at your brew house there. Is your wort that's coming out, does it have the same amount of ferment fermentable sugars? Um, definitely something to watch out for. But, you know, maybe it's just the yeast. Maybe the, the wort from the brew house is, is identical every time. Uh, that's where you're going to want to really use the microscope and, and check uh, your yeast. Are they, are they live? Are they, are they dying? Um, Definitely helps to do a, a viability check and then a vitality check if you can. Um, but if you can't, there are some um, checks like a force fermentation check um, and, and, and some other things to look at the health of your yeast there. Uh, something that can also happen is if you're using lager and ale strains in the same building, that's what we do, um, those aren't going to perform the same and uh, they have different preferences on fermentation temperature. So, uh, you know, if you have a lager strain that's made its way into your ale strain, you may see sort of a slower fermentation and maybe even a, a higher final gravity too. Um, another thing that can happen is, you know, maybe you're sort of selecting for premature flocculation. So if you're not properly crashing the tank before harvest, you may only be getting sort of the cells that tend to flocculate more. So they're going to clump together and then settle down to the bottom of the tank before uh, the rest of their, their buddies there. So if you do that over and over again, you may sort of be selecting for highly flocculent yeast that are going to fall out of the tank uh, during fermentation prematurely and are going to cause a higher final gravity.
You alluded to this earlier, um, talking about cross-contamination. I'd like to hear, um, I guess, first of all, how many strains do you typically have? And then Berea, it sounds like you've got definitely an ale and a lager and and possibly at least one other, you know, specialty strain at any given time. Uh, So correct me if that's not right. And then uh, get into sort of how, sort of the practical ways that you prevent cross-contamination in the brewery. Sure. So, um, you know, I... I am very fortunate. We are very fortunate where um, all of the ales, for the most part here, founders are, are fermented with one particular strain of ale yeast, and then all of our lagers are uh, one particular strain of lager yeast. So um, I've heard about breweries that have, you know, 10 plus different uh, quote unquote house strains. Um, but uh, here we try to, you know, keep it fairly simple and allow um, the malt, the water, and the hops to sort of shine um, for our, our different. Uh, brands here at Founders, but um, we do, you know, have two two different species of yeast. And when we were um, launching Solid Gold and really growing up our our uh, Pilsner program, um, it was a big challenge. So um, some things that we've run into, um, sort of more of a, a technical thing, is we have um, sometimes our our CO two headers or uh, sort of the um, the off gassing. Uh, portions of the tanks may be shared. So you may have um, cross-contamination through sort of the upper part of the tank and through the gas exchange that you may not really think about. Um, But we do look very closely at our um, cleaning and sanitation uh, practices. So uh, one thing that we do is we plate rinse water after we clean and sanitize a tank. And really, we're, we're looking for a complete absence of yeast in any sort of biological growth. But um, if we do see some yeast, uh, we can check and see, you know, is it ale yeast that was in there or is it lager yeast um, that, that was in there as well? And we can uh, keep that in mind when we uh, choose that tank to ferment the next batch. Um, we also, uh, you know, have a great team that plans the brews and, and uh, fermentations in the cellar. And uh, they do a great job with sort of segregating anything that is out of the ordinary or potentially wild um, from sort of the lifeblood of the brewery that, that pays the bills. Coming up. What I suggest is when you're designing a new cellar system, really take a look at all of the shared um, pipes and um, valves and equipment and make sure that both the bottom side of the tank is segregated from others and also the top side too. I'm John Bryce and you're listening to the Master Brewers Podcast from the Master Brewers Association of the Americas. Support for this podcast is brought to you by ABS Commercial is a full-service brewery and parts outfitter. From our Raleigh headquarters to our Denver office, we proudly offer brew houses and fermenters from three barrels and up, yeast brinks, boilers, kegs, chillers, tri-clamp, and other stainless parts, all with the quickest delivery and lead times in the industry. Learn more at abs-commercial.com or call 877-BREW-ABS. ABS Commercial. We are brewers. Additional support provided by Bring the world to your brew house with BSG's diverse selection of ingredients and services. Our dedicated customer service team and industry experience provides you with the assistance you need every step of the way. Make BSG your supplier of choice with products essential to making great artisanal beverages so you can stay focused on your craft. Visit us at bsgcraftbrewing.com or contact us at 1-800-374-2739. Here's what's coming up on the Master Brewers calendar. District Northern Illinois meets at Half Acre Beer May 31st. Don't miss the CO2 monitoring and the Brewery and Brew Pub webinar June 13th. District Philly's annual golf outing is June 14th. And District Midwest meets at Wolf's Ridge Brewing in Columbus June 29th. It's time to start making plans for the 2019 Master Brewers Conference. If you can only make it to one conference in 2019, this should be it. We're really mixing things up this time and heading to the Calgary Convention Center to see how Alberta celebrates Halloween. Check out the full count of events at mbaa.com for more details or to find a district meeting near you. 
Now back to the show. I know you want to talk about maintenance of stock cultures. Let's hear about the various options. And if you can, walk us through how this has evolved at Founders over the years. Yeah, so we're really fortunate that we have um, full support from uh, the Founders team to bring yeast in-house. And um, we have a really great cryogenic storage system. But I'll start with some of the really basic things that you can do uh, to have your own stock culture at your brewery. It really just takes some auger slants and a fridge. So um, one of the, the real, you know, the goals that uh, we have for bringing yeast in-house and having stock cultures, we want to make sure that our fermentations are consistent. Um, we have a lot of people that are, are planning, um, you know, the cellar and packaging and distribution. And it's important that uh, the beers finish on time. They have the right final gravity, the correct alcohol content for government compliance. Um, and that can all really be aided by having a, a strong stock culture program. Um, we also want to make sure that Founders Beer tastes like Founders Beer time and again. And if we had to really lean on a third-party supplier, I, we could not guarantee that. So um, that's a, another huge goal. So we want to make sure that the beer tastes the same, looks the same, and has the same shelf life that we're used to. Um, also, it's really nice to have stock cultures present right here in Grand Rapids. Because if something goes wrong, if we have a propagator that goes down, if we lose glycol, if we have cross-contamination problems, we're not too far back um, from growing it up and, and sort of starting from scratch there. So um, it puts uh, me at ease. I know it puts the upper management at ease that we have control to sort of start from scratch uh, when needed there. So um you know, we have a cryogenic storage program, but uh, the yeast can also be stored on auger slants. Um, and furthermore, that's just going to really protect you um, from any problems that can happen, but it can also um, mutate uh, and, uh, and, and, and cause problems there. We'll get into the cryo stuff in a minute, but uh, let's talk more about uh, for someone who's never, never stored stock cultures on, on auger slants, like let's, let's give them some, some, some practical uh, examples of um, what they would need to, to, to do that for the first time. Sure. So ideally, um, a lab would have an autoclave and um, auger uh, to prepare from scratch. But essentially, um, an auger slant is just a petri dish in a tube. So it's going to last a little bit longer. It's not going to dry out as quickly as a normal petri dish. Um, but uh, fortunately, there are a lot of lab uh, supply companies that can provide you with uh, just general YM auger, um, which has yeast extract malt extract, peptone, and glucose. And it's just going to be a, a general food source. Um, you can get those in and then streak a little bit of your, your culture onto the auger slants. And you're going to grow them for about five days, just like you would a normal Petri dish. Um, and um, after they're uh, fully grown, then you can seal them up, close them, and then put them in the fridge. And what's really nice is that that auger slant is going to last for, oh, up to six months or so, maybe even longer. And um, from the really, a really basic way to use the auger slant is when you're ready to uh, grow up and propagate yeast, um, you can uh, put a little bit more broth or wort into that slant, give it a good shake to sort of free those cells that grew on the auger, and then you can pour it into a liter or so of your wort uh, and start propagation from there. So, um, and they're just, they just live uh, in, in the fridge there. They're, they're pretty basic. Um, fortunately, yeast are, are pretty hardy organisms and they don't have really finicky um, storage um, things that they like. So, as long as they have they had food to grow and you keep them in the fridge, uh, they're, they'll be good to go. Okay. You've got a lot of experience with cryogenic storage. This is probably overkill for very small breweries, but it's a pretty interesting process. So let's hear about it. Sure. So um, it, cryogenic storage was uh, developed um, for yeast back in the 70s. And uh, from that pilot project, they're still waking up strains of yeast that are healthy and, and viable. So it's uh, a relatively new technology, but it's also uh, fairly tried and true. So um, cryogenic storage uses liquid nitrogen or a um, very deep uh, freezer, which is usually about minus 80 degrees Celsius. With liquid nitrogen, it's normally uh, about minus 196 
um, Celsius, so very, very cold. And the technique that's used is, is essentially um, what people use to store sperm and embryos and, and that sort of thing. It's basically stopping all uh, cellular activity at a very, very cold temperature. And that's going to prevent mutation or any sort of drift that you may see. But the thing is, you can't just put yeast in the deep freeze. They're going to lice. They don't, they don't like that. So what we do is we add a cryoprotectant. Uh, we use glycerol. There are other options there, but it's basically an antifreeze that you're going to mix into your yeast slurry prior to deposition. And, um, and the yeast are going to take a little bit of that glycerol or other cryoprotectant in. And what we use is um, we follow the EBC method for uh, storing yeast at ultra low temperatures. And um, we mix it with glycerol and we actually just use normal polypropylene straws. I use straws from Party City because uh, they have all sorts of different colors and we <laughs> use a green straw for our house ale yeast. I'm thinking all day IPA. And then we use uh, a yellow straw for um, our lager yeast like solid gold. And what I do is I just pipette a tenth of a mil, 100 microliters of that glycerol yeast slurry and into a straw. I'll back up a little bit. Prior to that, we'll seal the bottom end of the straw with a torch and forceps, and then um, we sterilize it in the autoclave. So make sure you get a polypropylene drinking straw. Most of them are, but you can check. Uh, but once you have a sterile straw sealed at one end, you'll pipette 100 microliters of that slurry, seal it up with the top, and then um, prepare it for depositing into the ultra low temperature storage. Now, best practice is to cool it slowly um, to reach that final temperature. What we do is um, we follow the method and we put it into a normal freezer, which is minus 20 degrees Celsius. And then um, we drop it down for at that temperature for about two hours. And then we finally drop it into the nitrogen uh, for the final phase there. Cool. Talk a little bit about how you how you wake it up and pitch it. Sure. So, um, you know, waking it up is much e easier than uh, depositing it. Depositing it is kind of a tedious task, and we'll do a couple dozen um, straws at a time. We can do a lot more, uh, but to wake it up, we just um, take it out of cryogenic storage. Uh, the yeast is stored in a straw in a cryogenic tube. Um, we have sterilized uh, scissors and forceps. And what we do is we first take the straw that's sealed with the yeast and it looks just like a little pillow packet or something like that. We'll drop it into either a sterilized uh, cup of water or uh, some sort of a sanitizer. And we s gently squeeze the straw and that's going to look for any leaks, any problems there. If it's nice and, and sound, then we'll just cut one end open and uh, we take the micropipetter and pipette the full volume, which is usually about 100 microliters, and put that into a, a test tube with 10 mils. You can also put it just into one mil, but we tend to find that um, the first sort of wake-up phase at 10 mils is just fine. And then from there, um, we follow just the rule of 10. So we go from 10 mils um, to 100 mils, 100 mils to one liter. But throughout that process, we submit samples to the quality lab to check for um, the species identity, check for any cross-contamination. Occasionally, we check for petite mutants as well. So um, once it's sort of awake and uh, in the test tube, it's pretty much good to go. Wade, you've worked at two, um, you've worked in micro at two large craft breweries during a period of, of pretty high growth. Talk about any hard yeast lessons you've learned or interesting curveballs you've had to deal with? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, well, uh, I think that um, most of the curveballs that I've seen have come from uh, external yeast, yeast suppliers, uh, whether it's the yeast not arriving on time, uh, not receiving the right strain, um, things like that have, have caused problems. And, and really, it's... it's uh, sort of driven us to um, bring yeast completely in-house, both at Bell's and at Founders. Um, but uh, it's also um, been kind of fascinating to, to, help, uh, to help others go through that journey of, of buying yeast from a third-party supplier. Um, as far as particular circumstances, um, I, 
I did I did have an experience where we did have a very very low level of cross contamination um, of yeast and of, of wild yeast, and we didn't really see it in um, the first you know few batches, but it really did rear its head uh, towards the end there, and it caused a lot of problems for production. So um, that was a, a big learning. Uh, curve for for me personally, and then for uh, for for the whole brewery to be conscious of the biomagnification that can happen when you have cross contamination at a very very low level, and uh, it comes out later. One thing that I've also um, seen is uh, cross contamination between lager and ale strains. So you know when you're at a big production brewery and really cranking out a lot of beer, uh, sometimes it's missed that you have uh, lager yeast contamination in an ale batch or vice versa. Uh, the beer may finish on time. It may taste pretty much the same, but if you have cells that are still left in the beer or uh, just a different uh, species or strain of yeast, it can uh, come out uh, later post-package. I bet the need to produce more and more dry hopped beer has affected your work and led to changes in yeast management and propagation during your career. Am I right about that? Right. Yeah. So dry hopping is a beautiful thing. I love dry hop beers, uh, but it's really it's really tough if you are harvesting from a, a beer that's already been dry hopped. So um, a lot of breweries are, are looking for, um, you know, a brand that can be dry hopped after the yeast is harvested. Um, so that would be more of like a cold dry hopping um, or, or what can be done is to do sort of a side by side cold dry hopped and then also warm dry hop that's not harvested and and blended for further down the line there so um yeah hops are hops are great but um they can stress yeast out and furthermore uh when you harvest from them the yeast can can carry around some of those hop compounds into the next batch so um if that's okay or that can be okay if it's going into sort of the, the same wort next time but uh it does it does tend to stress the yeast out to have uh, that, that the hop compounds around them. You mentioned that you're using a lot of freshly propagated yeast. Is is that a big factor in that that path of action, that course of action? That is definitely a big part. Um, you know, we're also just very fortunate to have a, a really good propagation setup that um, we can really crank out yeast uh, and have a consistent stream there. It also is a lot easier on the the labor and and the timing there so it does you know take a lot of labor and also um cross-contamination risk uh that you know has to be has to happen when you do harvest yeast and to avoid that you can um instead of harvesting you just pitch get the yeast out of there um sell it or, or do something like that instead of um putting it into a new batch of beer you mentioned co2 headers as a uh, potential risk for cross-contamination, which areas of the brewery, in your experience, have been responsible for the most micro problems? Well, particularly, um, you know, larger tanks that may be set up in a pod or tanks that are purchased sort of all at the same time. A lot of the the setup and 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 the engineering may come. Uh, from Germany or from uh, somewhere where they're used to just producing one particular type of beer. And uh, we always kind of get a kick out of uh, sometimes talking to the engineers that that set that up. And we say, you know, we really need a separate um, CO2 header for every tank that needs to be, um, you know, we can block it off completely from the other um, tanks nearby. And sometimes that really blows their mind because they're not used to um, having multiple different types of fermentation. Certainly ales next to lagers, that's that's not something that happens that often. Um, so what I suggest is when you're designing a new cellar system, really take a look at all of the shared um, pipes and um, valves and equipment and make sure that both the bottom side of the tank is segregated from others and also the top side too. All right. Any other areas you've seen be uh, high risk or, or problematic? Let's see. Well, I have seen yeast contamination in the heat exchanger, right? So uh, that's a really sensitive area of any brewery. You want to you know, brew great wort that's going to ferment into tasty beer, but it can be a challenge to cool it down um, time and again with, uh, without compromising the wort. So there may be yeast that hangs out. Um, right at the end of the heat exchanger, 
or even in the aeration area when you're injecting sterile air or oxygen. Um, yeast would love to hang out there and get a fresh shot of air and wort and sort of start that fermentation. And that may uh, not be detected if you're using just a house strain of yeast. That's where it lives even before you pitch the, the bulk of the yeast cells. But if you are switching yeast strains, you may find that you're seeing yeast in the process before you even intentionally add it. So what you can do to check that is to pull an aseptic sample of your wort. That's something we do for um, all of the brew houses here at Founders Weekly. You can play to make sure that you don't have any uh, bacterial growth or any yeast growth there. So um, that's a great way to check. You can also pull a sterile sample right at knockout into the fermentation tank and make sure that you see the yeast that you're supposed to see and not anything else. I should know this, but I don't. Is, is Founders using any mixed uh, mixed cultures? No. Okay. Um, I was going to ask about any precautions you've taken uh, to, to avoid disaster there, but um, not having any is probably the best precaution you could take to avoid disaster. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we do have plans to do um, some fermentations with non-Saccharomyces species, but um, we're going to do that at the Detroit Brew House, which has a really nice uh, three-barrel pilot system, and it's far away from Grand Rapids. Oh, you also mentioned you wanted to give a plug for the, um, for the Food Safety uh, Committee, right? Yes. Yeah. So I'm honored to be a member of the MBAA Food Safety Subcommittee. And uh, we look at all sorts of food safety uh, topics. We have um, uh, a, a blog or sort of a, a forum online where you can ask questions. But most importantly, we do offer HACCP training. So that's hazard analysis and critical control points. And that's a way to protect um, the end consumer for any hazard that, that may be happening uh, with your product. And as a company grows, it's a better idea or it becomes a a good idea to look at um, risks that can cause problems. So uh, right before the Calgary uh, conference in October, um, there will be HACCP training. So that's going to happen uh, in Calgary for two days prior to the conference. And so uh, users can come and, and learn about HACCP and um, learn about the ins and outs of that with a brewing perspective. And it's going to be held at the same hotel uh, where the conference is. So. Uh, I just wanted to do a little shout out uh, for, for the food safety group, and they'll be doing HACCP training prior to the Master Brewers Conference in Calgary. Sounds good. It's a great course. I've been involved with it uh, in several past years, and it, it really is uh, worth doing, uh, especially if your brewery is um, you know, making soft drinks or, or you know, other things that are maybe a little bit higher risk than traditional beer. Um, not that beer's not risky, because uh, we often tend to uh, tell ourselves that it, it that it's low risk, but um, there are plenty of um, there are plenty of things that can hurt people other than um, human pathogens, such as broken glass. So uh, it's a, it's a good idea to to assess your risks. Right. It takes it takes some thinking uh, to convince somebody, but uh, beer is food. It's something that goes into your body and uh, can definitely cause problems if it's not um, made in a, a safe manner. <laughs> That was Wade Begro here on the Master Brewers Podcast. Back in January, Wade gave a great presentation at the annual conference District Michigan puts on together with the Michigan Brewers Guild. Master Brewers members can download Wade's Yeast 101 presentation, both slides and audio, or any of the other 781 and counting files in the District Presentations Archive at mbaa.com. I'll add some links to the show notes, but thanks to the efforts of volunteer district officers like Debbie Newstifter-Smith, Members have ongoing access to presentations given at Master Brewers District meetings, both near and far. Are you enjoying the Master Brewers podcast? Let me tell you about a simple way you can help us keep making more. Take a minute to thank our sponsors. There's no way we could produce this show without generous support from sponsors like Hopsteiner, ABS, Proximity Malt, White Labs, and BSG. So please let them know you heard their message on the Master Brewers podcast and that you appreciate their support. It's time to start making plans for the 2019 Master Brewers Conference. If you can only make it to one conference in 2019, this should be it. We're really mixing things up this time and heading to the Calgary Convention Center to see how Alberta celebrates Halloween. You can find all the details on the Meetings tab at mbaa.com. Place. Man, my face is full of courage.
I can't get stuck, I can't be losing tonight.